Hi, um, and welcome to Frank and Mary here on Martha's Vineyard. If you haven't seen our show before, my name is Art Bergeron. My day job is as an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell, but this is not about my day job. It's about my friends, Frank and Mary, whose goal in life, as many of you have heard me say before, is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. And my, my wonderful co-host here is Sandy Cordobi. It's like a few people know me, everybody knows her. Um, the goal of the show is to really help you as if you identify with Frank and Mary and want to just keep staying at home, help you know the people you need to know and the programs you need to know about in order to do just that. We've got a great guest today who has been on, was on, I think, a couple of years ago, but is back and is, and is really, I think, just a boatload of information about these, you know, life in, at, a, at the, the Edgartown Council on Aging in these difficult times. Sandy, whom do we have today? And thank you, by the way, Sandy, for being here, right? Thanks, Arthur, and hello, everyone. And Victoria Hasselbarth is with us today. And Victoria is, I believe, the outreach coordinator. Victoria, you can correct me on your title in a second, but the outreach coordinator, I think, for the Edgartown Council on Aging. And Victoria is my go-to person um, because while she is the outreach coordinator of the Edgartown Council on Aging, Victoria knows all things and all resources available on Martha's Vineyard as a whole for our elder population and, and is so generous and giving of her expertise. And I am so excited to have Victoria with us today to talk a little bit about what's going on. Hi, Victoria. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Art. It's so good to be with you and to see you again. Um, as you say, I'm the social outreach worker at the Edgartown Council on Aging, and I've been here for oh, over 10 years. Um, my primary responsibility is to identify the needs of within our older adult community in Edgartown and pair those needs with available services. And often uh, I make referrals to you, Sandy, and your team at Horizons. And uh, everyone speaks very highly of the work that you do. And Art, you as well, um, when people are considering uh, advanced care planning and estate planning, I often make a rever referral to your law firm. So we're all very interconnected and working collaboratively, which is one of the beauties of living on the vineyard. Um, that is, so, that I mean, is definitely and, the case. One of the yeah. beauties of living on the vineyard. That's right. It takes a village and here we are. So getting back to uh, your question about how we serve the needs of the community at the Council on Aging, um, frequently I will get phone calls from individuals who might be struggling with a health issue. They may have had their hip replaced. They may be just getting older and feeling very frail and vulnerable and unable to say, clean their home or prepare a meal. They might need help with bathing and grooming. And at that point, I would introduce them to you, Sandy, and what you offer through Horizons, or uh, especially if they're lower income and just living on Social Security, I will sometimes make a referral to elder services of the Cape and Islands who can also provide that type of service. And um, no day is alike. Every time I step into my office, uh, I never know who will call with what problem and sometimes it's, it's uh, there are difficult to solve dilemmas that we face. Mm. And I'm fun. especially right now. Yes. Mm. And, and, I, and the last time I saw you, Victoria, you were actually delivering, I think, a meal to a family out in Katema, right? Oh, yeah. and, you, and you told yes. me that, you know, a part of one of the many things that you were doing was just trying to do that, just getting getting to a whole lot of folks and doing kind of the very... I want to say hands-on outreach, you know, because because as you know, your folks are our folks, and they're all trapped. You know, they're all kind of stuck at home, right? Mm -hmm. Can I well, talk I, about how how that is going, and if that is continuing to happen? Yeah, I think all human service agencies have faced enormous shifts and challenges as a result of the pandemic. Many of us had these working models in place on how we administer services, and we've had to reevaluate and change almost every single one of them. Um, one example, as you mentioned, Art, is that pre-pandemic, our Council on Aging, otherwise known as the Anchors, used to serve in-house meals twice a week to the community. 
and we would have about 60 people coming in, enjoying a meal, often enjoying a program. Sometimes they would wander into my office if they were in need of, of a referral or some type of service. And we had a, a nice rhythm about it and a predictability. And then the pandemic hit and we had to shut our doors and scratch our heads for a bit and figure out, okay, well, how are we going to feed these individuals who've come to rely upon our service and more importantly, those who don't want to venture into the grocery store or the pharmacy, how are we going to kept, keep them fed every week for the duration of this until the vaccine is available? So we began making meals of about oh, 250, I'd say, per week. Wow. And wow. using a group of dedicated volunteers, getting those meals out there to families. So seniors will be able to call in and request the number of meals they want. Some people request five meals for the week, others request seven, and then our volunteers deliver, deliver them. But as you can imagine, this is um, tremendously taxing on our human resources. So, uh, you know, those first few months we were all scrambling and now we've gotten into a rhythm, but um, we still use uh, more resources than pre-pandemic. And by the way, just as a follow-up, it's obviously taxing on your human resources. I would think it's taxing on your financial resources too. If you're delivering that many meals, was that part of the, the Council on Aging budget? Or, you know, how, how, are you, how have you managed all of that? That's a lot. Well, very creatively and through multiple sources. So uh, we ask for a donation for those people who can contribute of $2 per meal. And many people contribute, others don't, especially those living just on their social security incomes. Um, we have a very generous friends organization who does fundraising for us throughout the year. We also took advantage of some community-wide grants, uh, permanent endowment, Martha's Vineyard Savings Bank, uh, the cottagers in Oak Bluffs, and others who were very generous with their, their assets in allowing this program to continue. What an amazing gift to the community. That is so wonderful to hear. And I've been, I have some clients that have been beneficiaries of that program and the soup program, and, and I don't know what they would have done without it. Thank you. So, so Sandy, you want to ask about, about, we were talking before about the back, not, not an unusual topic, the vaccine and, and kind of from, you know, what, how folks are kind of dealing with that. Sandy. Yeah. So Victoria, what are the, I'm sure that like all of us, you're getting inundated with folks that are asking questions about, you know, we see all the stuff on the news about, you know, it's, it, we're coming up on February 1st and, of the elders being able to be up next and, and what kind of questions are you getting and, and how are you turfing those questions? Well, people are very anxious. So, you know, as you know, one of our um, primary concerns is about social isolation. So many of our clients have been in their homes since March, rarely venturing out. And we know that social isolation is a determinant of long-term health. Um, the studies have proven that. And the, those who are most isolated are um, some of them becoming a bit depressed and calling us on a regular basis asking when this vaccine is going to be available to them so that they can begin returning to their routines. Um, and because we have about as much information as, as any other agency on the island, uh, we get our information from the hospital uh, who, who is post regularly about the status of the vaccines. Um, Island Healthcare also has a very good uh, link toward uh, pandemic data and the, the, the numbers, um, but, but we don't know how this is going to roll out. Um, uh, I do know I have uh, seniors who are in line for a vaccine, uh, some who will be receiving it this week, um, but, um, and I do know the governor uh, created a, um, you know, a mandate that if you're over 75, as of February 1st, that vaccine will be available. So we're just going to have to stay tuned. It's a real challenge. I know I was, I was doing a couple of shows yesterday um, and one, one, or I, no, it was, I wasn't doing shows. I was speaking to the council and aging directors in Hudson and in Marlboro near where I live. 
And they had just heard this, this comment from the governor, apparently like at his press conference, saying, if you've got, if you've got a, a, a problem, everything's gonna be handled through the senior centers. And so they were getting these calls and emails, like, what's this about? You know, it was, it was, that's the real challenge right now. I think every, once again, everybody is well-intentioned and wants to get all of this done. But it, as you're describing, Victoria, you know, it's, it, it's one thing to say you want to get it done, but the question is how to operationalize it, you know? Yes. And, and, and well, I, Art, I read the same thing you did. I, I subscribed to the electronic Mass Council on Aging newsletter. And then when I opened it up last week and saw that the councils on aging were going to be administering the vaccine, I almost fell out of my seat because <laughs> I heard nothing about it. No one's approached us and uh, we're just waiting to hear from the boards of health and the hospital to see how it's going to be rolled out. We'd be happy to be instrumental in that process if we're called upon, but nothing's been said. But you haven't found, you have gotten to the office one morning and there's a, thing, a big thing of vaccines at the door. No. <laughs> no, please, please distribute this while you're doing your food delivery. No, no, nothing. There's nothing like that. Well, I think the hospital here has been designated as our official dispensing site. And I have ultimate faith that they were, I know they're working on it. I've heard from lots of folks, they're working on a plan and, um, and they will execute the plan and, and people are, are nervous and worried and, and I don't blame them. So I think we just have to be patient and give them a few more days. And the hospital web is updating some things on their website. So I think for those that can, access the website, they should do so and keep an eye on things. And then um, for those that can't, the rest of us will, and we'll share information as we get it. And we can look back, we can look back and in, in, uh, how the uh, testing was unrolled in those initial weeks that it, it was a very rough start and people were very concerned how they might get tested. But then after a while, they set up the, um, the operation at the high school and they've tested many thousands of people so far and it's a pretty seamless operation. And therefore, I'm, I'm based on that, I'm projecting that the vaccine rollout will be very similar once it's established. Yeah. Now, so now in the meantime, Victoria, you know, what is, can, can you give us a sense of, I don't want to say what is happening at the senior center because you're closed, right? But, uh, and, I, and I assume that you're not, op you're not open to the public at this point, but do you, do you know, are there, is, there, is there programming that is still going on? Kind of what is happening and how are you staying in touch with people? Obviously well, you're doing it partially by going and delivering meals and talking to them, but how yes. else are you connecting with folks? Well, we're busier than ever. Our director of senior services, Maris Keating, offers a lot of programs through Zoom, such as knitting and yoga, meditation. Uh, she'll be offering uh, an opportunity to partake in the great courses. She's going to have Josh Levy from Vineyard Nutrition come and, and give a lecture via Zoom sometime this month. And uh, there's a book talk coming up. So there's a lot going on electronically, but we realize that not everyone is on Zoom. So we have to figure out other ways to connect with them. We've made a lot of home visits, physically distanced, of course, uh, delivering little surprises such as hot chocolate, uh, amaryllis growing kits over the holidays, masks and hand sanitizers, calendars and date books. Um, Halloween, we did reverse trick or treat where the staff and volunteers dressed up and we went to hundreds of homes with candy. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, and we're planning a Valentine's Day surprise. So every day we're out there, we're knocking on doors, we're making phone calls and we're finding ways to connect with hundreds of people. It is, it's the little things that you don't even, you know, that just kind of crop up that you didn't think about, right? That, um, <coughs> I have a lot of, excuse me, I have a lot of folks that usually go into SBS or DeRosa's or the drugstore or wherever and get their calendar each year in January. And now that they're not going to those places, they don't have a calendar. It's, it's really <laughs> surprising the things that people are missing out on. Right. right. It's, a mil it's a million of those little things. It's a million of those little things. Mm -hmm. and, 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 what, and what are you looking at into the future? You said you've got a, you've got a, you know, you've got a Valentine's Day something that is coming. So we're not going to talk too much about that. Yes, right? that's going to be a little surprise. And we'll be out visiting, um, you know, 100 or more people with that surprise. 
and a lot of people are signing up for our Zoom programs. And I'm also very busy just fielding questions. Um, it, it's very interesting to note that people's concerns and needs have shifted a, a bit since the start of the pandemic with more time on their hands um, and knowledge of the casualties that the pandemic has brought, older adults are thinking more about advanced care planning. So we've had Zoom workshops in collaboration with Healthy Aging on this topic so people can learn about the documents they need to get in place to be prepared, such as a healthcare proxy and different estate planning essentials. We've made referrals, Art, to your law firm and to others to uh, help our adults navigate this very complex terrain. Yeah, I know that Sandy, interestingly, before COVID had started, Sandy and I had spent a lot of time talking about how we could be more supportive of the whole conversations project that, had been, that, 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 that Patty Moore and others have been really kind of advancing here to get fo folks focused on that. I, but I think that no... The pandemic has so clarified the need for those documents, you know, because you just don't know when you're going to find yourself in a position where you can't sign documents because you're in a building where nobody can get in, you know, yeah. and where you really need to have somebody who is on the outside who can handle things for you. But if if you haven't set that up, you're, you're just stuck, you know, you just, you're in. So I, I, I'm, I'm really hoping that as a result of all of this, as people have more ability to kind of uh, to outreach, they'll be focusing more on that, just to make sure that that as time goes on, everybody has those things. That everybody yeah. has those things, right? We had a we had a recent coalition meeting. I'm on the coalition um, healthy aging um, group and the coalition for advanced care planning. And and and, and as Arthur speaks, uh, we've done a lot of a lot of work around this. And what I will say is that. These conversations that we're having with families are much more intense than they used to be around this very topic. Elders are very concerned, and, and they should be, but so should all of us. From the age of 18 on up, everyone needs to assign a healthcare proxy that can speak for them in, the, in, in some instance where they cannot speak for themselves. Um, I think a lot of people don't even realize, and, and while we on our show concentrate mostly on elders. Um, I also want people to realize that if, if you've got an 18 year old who may be off at college or even here on the vineyard that becomes very sick or in an accident, hospital can tell you nothing. Once they're 18, the hospital can tell you nothing without their permission. And if they can't give that permission, then, then other people are making decisions about your family member. But when the el where the elders are concerned, people are very much aware now that what if this, what if, what if, what if this happened to me um, or a loved one? And who would know, do I want to be put on a ventilator? Don't I want to be put on a ventilator? What does that mean to be put on a ventilator? Um, and these discussions that we're having with families in their homes now are very real. And, and talking about who is the healthcare proxy, who should be making those decisions, it's not always a spouse, or sometimes it's not even a family member. It's a really emotional time when those decisions have to be made. That's a high power time. And, and the hospital just needs to know, who did you have a conversation with about what you would want at a time like this? And um, so I would encourage anybody that hasn't had those conversations or wants to hear more about it to contact any one of the three of us. And we will make sure that you have our numbers. They'll be put up on the screen and, um, and that, you know, you can contact any one of us and we will help make sure that you get the information that you need to be sure that you, you have your documents in order. I, I know I just, I just watched this. Of course, I see this play out all the time, but I really watched it kind of close hand because one of my sisters died last week and, oh. uh, you know, fairly suddenly two weeks before everything's fine. She, but she was older. She's 86. She's my oldest sister. The one that used to, the one that you, who used to wheel me around downtown, and people would say this was in the fifties and say, "Oh, is that yours? Oh, he looks so much like you." She just loved this stuff. She went, you know, she ended up she had a family of seven, right? A lot of girls, so there were a lot of girls around. But she, 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 you know, it, it was very healthy. Um, her husband died a few years ago. He had dementia. She worked with him, you know, and then suddenly there was a, you know, an issue 
oh, having trouble breathing, they went to the hospital or to the doctors, oh, there's a spot on your lung. You know, and, 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 but she was very clear. Fortunately, she was clear. You know, I don't want to be in the hospital. I want to be at home. You know, like Frank and Mary, she wanted to die at home, which she did, you know, with her daughters around and with some care folks that were able to help out. But, that, you know, in that situation, she had the ability to be saying those things. But I always say to people, you know, when you're thinking about a healthcare proxy, think about how you want to be treated in those situations. And then think how bad it would be if you didn't have the ability to say anything. And you were just watching yourself being treated, you know, in a way that you didn't like, you know, because you didn't have the proxy and you hadn't talked with anybody. So it's like, you know, you see those things, you just see them play out. They're just, they're very difficult. So Victoria, just kind of to, to, clo to close, can you, can you give folks just some basic information if they wanted to reach out to you? How do they, you know, how do they get in touch with the Council on Aging? You know, is, it, is there an email address? Is there a phone number? Who should they talk to when they call? Is somebody really there? You're there right now, I know. I am, yes. Well, we're working mostly remotely. Generally, there's one of us here during the day. We're a staff of six, and there's often someone to answer the phone, but someone can give us a ring and leave a message at 508 627 4368. We check the messages regularly and we'll call that person back within 24 hours. Terrific. And is, and is there an email? If, if they were trying to email you, is there one email they should use? Uh, there is. It is, um, Ed, bear with me for just a moment, Art. I should know it off the top of my head. By your head. <laughs> it's, um, <clears throat> well, they could email me and maybe you can uh, put it across the screen. Yep. Prior that's right. that's, uh, we're we're going to ask our folks at MBTV to do that. We really appreciate their willingness to film these shows. Thank you. Yes, and may I may I um, just add one thing in conclusion, um, on a on a positive note, because I think you know amidst all the sadness that's going on and the struggles that we have with the pandemic, I think it's important to stay optimistic. And I, one thing that I've noticed is that the majority of our clients are supporting one another. Uh, my colleague Maris Keating said that she feels they're doing so uh, in an outstanding and in an astonishing way. Uh, we had tried to create a phone tree to keep people connected early on, and then we realized that they're doing it already independently. So <laughs> the COAs are a catalyst. Uh, they create a space for older adults to meet and to build relationships. And those relationships have been widely inclusive and well-maintained. And I think that, um, you know, from our microcosm here on the vineyard, the pandemic uh, has brought out the best in, in human nature. And it's made me realize for the first time that the COAs are a hub that foster networks of support. Uh, many of our older adults have lived through a lot, wars, famines, global health crises, and most of them are well prepared and have the tools to rise to the challenge. A lot of them have, you know, and, and as you say, that's been a real sense of bonding. Although I'm not, I'm still not sure if, my, if, 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 if Martha's Vineyard is the microcosm or is truly unique because of the level of cohesiveness of the community. There's just something about being on that island. As you know, as you say, you know, people come for the beaches, but they stay for the people, you know, the, all the people that migrated there because they, they first came and said, wow, look at that. But then they realize that there's something, it must be the water too, and not just the ocean, it must be something in the water. So anyway, Victoria, thank you very, very much for doing this. Sandy, thank you um, for, for setting this up. And I really appreciate it. And I think we're gonna, we may take, um, you know, the kind of Victoria's advice and, and maybe talk to some of the folks, you know, in the hospital and in the medical community so that maybe we can even be using this show to the extent possible to keep people updated about all of this, because this is going to be the big topic of conversation, I think, for the next several months. So sure is. thank you. Thank yes. you, Victoria. Thank you, Sandy. Thank and, you, Art. Uh, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Sandy. It was a pleasure. And, and Art, my deepest condolences about your loss. Thank you very much. So folks, I hope you enjoyed this program. I, I think that you've got some good information about how to reach out if you need to be reaching out. It's wonderful to see how the folks in the vineyard like so often have really kind of come together over all of this. 
Uh, and we will look forward to seeing you on the next installment of Frank and Mary here on Martha's Vineyard. Thank you very much. Thank you.